Today I'm going to show you how to get amazing oven spring in your sourdough bread and how to get it every single time you bake. Hi, I'm Sune and I'm a food geek. If you're new to this channel, I make videos about baking sourdough bread and amazing food from all over the world. I'm on a quest to get the best out of every single ingredient. And my goal is to teach you how to do that in simple and understandable steps. So join me by subscribing and ringing the bell so you won't miss any future videos. First, let me say that this is a holistic method, which means that you can't just take one thing and then expect amazing results. Everything that I explain here is what goes into getting great oven spring every single time. So if you skip certain parts, don't expect consistent results. So watch the video to the end so you know everything that you need to know. The first thing that goes into great oven spring is the strength of your starter. If you have a starter that just kind of uh, moves up to about double size in a couple of uh, hours and then it deflates, it's not really good enough. You need a super strong one. And uh, let me explain how you get that. You don't have to start all over. You can use your existing starter. If you don't have a starter, follow the card here and uh, I have a method for you to build your own starter. But to maximize the potential of this starter, you need to uh, get it to have all the yeast that it can. And uh, you can do that by doing certain things. First of all, it needs to be stored warm. In Celsius, we're talking late 20s and in Fahrenheit, it's between 80 and 90 degrees. You need to find a place in your kitchen that's consistently warm. A good place is maybe on top of your fridge or another place where there's a, like a constant heat source. It can also be on your windowsill or uh, my preferred method is using a proofer, but uh, those are expensive. So I understand if you don't have one of those. Then what you feed your starter is also important. Uh, you need to feed it flour that has lots of nutrients. And uh, whole grain is great for that. Um, I wouldn't feed it 100% whole grain. It just uh, turns into kind of a thick paste instead of fluid, which makes it a little bit more annoying to work with. So I don't regularly feed 100% uh, whole grain to my starter. I usually uh, feed it uh, half whole grain and half bread flour. That works just fine. Then there's the water you feed to your starter. If you live in a place that has great water quality, then uh, kudos to you. You're uh, lucky. I also live in a place that has great water quality but not everybody does and uh, it's common that a lot of chlorine is added to the water by the waterworks and uh, you can smell that and that will inhibit the yeast in the starter. What you can do is you can take some water and put it in a pitcher and just let it stand on, your, uh, on the kitchen counter for a couple hours then the chlorine will dissipate and then you can use it just fine. If you're worried about it just use bottled water. It's not a problem. Then there's the actual feeding. When uh, we feed our starters, uh, there's usually a, a proportion formula that people talk about. Uh, it's uh, it's one two two or one three three, and what that is is the proportions of starter to flour to water. What I recommend when you want to build a strong starter is feeding one five five. That means a very little amount of starter to relatively much water and flour. Now you're asking yourself, why does that work? Well, the more food there is for the yeast, the more it'll attract more yeast. So that way you get more yeast into the resulting starter. Then if you keep repeating that, you'll have a super strong starter. The last thing that's important for the starter is how you store it. I know a lot of people put their starters in the fridge during the week if they only bake on the weekends. But honestly, you should just keep it on your counter. It doesn't kill the starter. So what you do is after you bake, you just leave a little bit of starter in there. It can be five or 10 grams and uh, you just leave it until the next time you bake. And then when you're going to bake, you feed the starter, do it one, two, two, one, three, three. And once that starter has grown to its full potential, you can just mix it in to your dough and use it. That way there's a lot less discard as well, which is an added bonus. The next part that's really important for oven spring is gluten development. And how do you develop gluten in your dough, you ask? Well, really gluten is developed by hydrating the proteins in the flour. But uh, another way is to agitate dough. 
which means kneading or stretch and fold or slap and fold or coil folds, whatever method that you prefer, it's not really important. But I like to really get the gluten development started early on. So what I do is auto lease and auto lease is uh, basically you just mix the water and the flour in your recipe and just leave it standing around. Most sources I've found say that you should auto lease from 20 to 60 minutes but I usually auto lease for four hours and that works just fine. So don't worry about it. Once the dough is auto leased, you can uh, mix it uh, with your starter and salt. And then basically the whole process gets started. When developing the gluten, it's uh, really nice to know if the gluten is properly developed. And there's a simple method you can use calling the window pane test. And uh, I have a video here that shows you how to do that. Basically how it works is you grab the dough with your hands, you stretch it and stretch it and stretch it until you have a very thin membrane of dough that if you hold it up to the light, you can see the light through it. If it breaks when you try and pull the window pane, that means the gluten isn't properly developed. And uh, that means you need to do something. What I do is I do a window pane test after the last stretch and fold. If the dough still doesn't have proper uh, gluten development at this point, I will uh, extend the stretch and folds, do one, two more if it's needed. That way you can get the dough to the point where it's needed. Then the next step in the process of bread making is the bulk fermentation. And that's also super important for oven spring. The first part of the bulk fermentation is the agitation stage where you do coil folds or stretches and folds. Just go through this and make sure that the gluten development is good. And then the second part is the actual fermentation stage where you just leave the dough alone. And what you need to do is just put it in a tub. I put it in a, in a see-through tub and I put a little line where the dough goes to and then I can monitor the growth. Usually you would grow the dough from anywhere from 25% to 100%. It really depends on what you plan to do later on. So how do you know when the bulk fermentation is over? Well, this is probably the thing that's the hardest to learn because you kind of have to gauge the dough, touch it, wiggle it, just look at it. You're looking for signs of fermentation. So there should be bubbles, there should be bulges. When you wiggle the container, the dough should jiggle and seem light. If it's still tough, then chances are there you still need to ferment longer. Once the bulk is over, it's time to shape the dough. And that's usually done in two steps. There's the pre-shaping and the actual final shape. What this does is the pre-shaping helps the dough sort of turn into approximately the shape that you want it to. And the final shape, you'll coerce the dough into being that shape. And then you'll put it in the banneton, which will accentuate that it stays in that shape. What the shaping will do is that it will help the dough to stand up when it's on the table before you score and when you put it in the oven. It'll also help the surface to stay together uh, so that only the places where you score it will expand and the rest of the dough will stay in as one cohesive piece. Then the last part is retarding the dough. It's really important also to build flavor, but when you take out a very cold piece of dough, it'll stay together more and it'll be much easier to score it. It'll be much easier to maneuver into the oven without it losing its shape. The other part of retarding that'll help your oven spring is that the cold dough will release more steam and for longer, which means that you get better oven spring. Then there's the actual scoring of the bread. Why is this important? Well, it's important because you're going to be creating a weak point in the dough where you tell the dough this is where you should expand. And how you actually do the score, how deep you cut it, at the, what angle you have the lamb, that will tell the dough in which way to go. I'm going to be making a video about uh, scoring bread, so look forward to that. It'll be out soon. Uh, and it'll show you how to do these things. But it's very important to get good oven spring. Another thing that scoring is important for is the crumb. Because when you get good oven spring, the, the bread will rise and expand and it'll leave more rooms for holes in the crumb. And the last reason to score is 
well, the finished bread looks really beautiful and professional. So why not do it? Then we're on to the baking part. There's a couple of things you should do to get great oven spring. And one is you should bake very hot, hot as hell. And I don't mean hell as a swear here, but as the actual temperature. Um, the other thing is you need to bake with steam. There's two ways to achieve this. One is using a Dutch oven or a pot. Uh, and basically steam will be released from your bread. And since it's in a small container, the bread will steam itself. The other way is to add a, a pan with boiling water or maybe a pan with lava stones that you throw on a, some water just before it starts baking. That's a great way to make steam as well. Most people prefer the pot because it's just much simpler. So to get everything scorching hot, you need to preheat your oven for a long time. I usually preheat to 260 degrees Celsius. That's 500 degrees Fahrenheit. And I put in my Dutch oven uh, and my baking steel and I heat that for a whole hour so that I'm just completely certain that everything is scorching hot. And that brings me to the baking steel. You should really use a baking steel or pizza stone because it'll help even out the heat in the oven. Um, most uh, ovens have a coil at the bottom and a coil at the top. And what happens is that if the bread is too far down, you get a scorched bottom. If the bread is too far up, you get a scorched top and not a finished bread. What the baking steel or baking stone will do is that it'll absorb heat and even out the heat in the oven. So that's not really for oven spring, although I'm sure it helps, but it helps you to get a finished bread that's not overdone in certain places and not really done in other places. So let me summarize. How do you get great oven spring? Well, one, you need a super active starter. Two, you need great gluten development and make sure you test that you have great gluten development. Three, learn how to gauge a bulk fermentation. It's so important to know when the dough is ready to be shaped. Uh, if you over ferment, the dough will just turn into a flat puddle and there's nothing you can do. So just keep baking and make notes and make sure that you know how the dough is progressing through the bulk so you can see when it's good and ready. Four, shape the dough so it has a tight gluten network on the surface of the dough. This requires good gluten development, so back to that. Five, retard your dough. It's so important that the dough is cold. It'll help you when you're scoring. The dough isn't just gonna splatter into a puddle. It's just gonna stay up and you cut it and then you can see it starts opening and you move it to the oven really quickly. Which brings me to the next one, scoring. Score your dough, learn how to score. It's really important. You need to use a lamb with a super sharp razor blade and you should change it often. So don't get one of those lambs that has a, a blade attached, but because in two, three bakes, you're gonna be like, nah, I need a new one, but you can't change it. So get one with an exchangeable uh, razor blade. They're not much more expensive. The last part is seven, bake super hot and with steam. So those are my secrets to getting amazing oven spring every single time you bake. If you need an actual recipe and a description, uh, I have a, a recipe called sourdough bread for beginners. Follow this card to watch that video. If you'd like a written version of all these secrets, I have an article on my blog, uh, which is linked in the description. Remember to subscribe and ring the bell so you won't miss any future videos. See you next week.